All right, everyone. Welcome, LinkedIn friends. I am so excited today to have some special guests that I'm turning my feet over today for the sake of civilization. Uh, and that is no exaggeration. Anybody who's been following me knows how passionate I've been for the last year about a technology called Far UV Light 222 nanometer. It's relatively new. Uh, it's been studied uh, in the last five, six, seven years, but it's actually been around for four and a half billion years coming from the sun. And uh, what's great about uh, UV light, far UV light, is that it has the ability to, uh, to deactivate viruses and influenza and all sorts of bad actors uh, in, our, in our space. And uh, we have to assume that despite the fact this is a one in a hundred year event, it may not always be a one in a hundred year event. And we need to prepare ourselves for the next pandemic. And so I've been very passionate about it, advocating it, trying to bring attention to it. So I have some extraordinary guests with us today. I'm gonna hand it over to David Mextroff, who's the CMO of a company called Healthy that I have invested in, in order to put my money where my mouth is and do everything I can to bring attention to far UVC light. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to David. Uh, make sure you ask your questions. They'll be showing up on the right side of the screen. And after we spend some time uh, sharing what we know, uh, we'll take questions from so David, take it away. All right, great. Thank you, Matt. And uh, welcome everybody to the 222 Day webcast. Uh, as Matt shared a bit about what we're covering today, uh, you know, the purpose of today is really to wait, raise awareness for a wavelength of UV, uh, specifically 222 nanometers, which is also known as far UVC. We're going to be discussing the science behind this technology and its potential to help the world get through this pandemic and mitigate future ones. Uh, for all those joining via our live streams, whether it be via LinkedIn or our healthy YouTube, uh, please feel free to say hello and where you're joining from in the world by typing into the chat. Uh, please also feel free to post any questions as Matt mentioned. Uh, we'll be collecting those uh, throughout the session and coming back to those as part of a Q&A portion of today. Uh, I'm also very happy to introduce our speakers today. So first and foremost, Fred Maxick, co-founder and chief scientific officer of Healthy. Uh, Teresa King, cabin integration leader at Boeing. Bobby Lloyd, chief baking officer at Magnolia Bakery. Dr. Michael Roizen, chief wellness officer at the Cleveland Clinic. And as Matt already introduced himself, he's the CEO and co-founder of RSE Ventures, an executive fellow at Harvard Business School and investor slash customer of Healthy. So to get us started, uh, let's talk about what FAR UBC 222 is and why it's so important to have a day dedicated to it. So Fred, let's start with you. Thanks, thanks. Well, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, where in the world you're from. But um, today to me marks this first celebration of 222 Day and it, it's important because it's about education, it's about tools, it's about technology, it, it's about unlearning things we learned as children. Um, I was always told when I was in school, uh, UV light is terrible for you, stay away from it, be, be away from it, put on sunscreen. Um, but the fact is that this novel form of light, this 222 nanometer light, is a form of, of UV that is, is not harmful to us. It does not affect our bodies, but um, it actually is very, very harmful uh, to pathogens, uh, specifically uh, to, to viruses and, and bacteria. Um, what it does is it, is, it, is it disrupts their ability to replicate, uh, both by interacting with proteins and with the genetic material they're made of. But it cannot penetrate the body. It cannot penetrate our eyes. It cannot penetrate our skin. And, and that's why it's so important. But along with that, over the past about decade and a half since I've been familiar with it, um, it has evolved. It has become a more commercially available product. It has become something that's becoming more efficient to manufacture, such that it gives us probably the best tool we have today to inoculate our environment, uh, to, to make our space safer, to reduce the pathogen loads we have to live with, we have to work with, we have to shop with. Um, and that creates resilience in this environment in a day where pandemics like this are, are likely to happen again. And, uh, and this might be a test of something that could be far worse, hopefully not, but it gives us a very, very good tool to disrupt this pathogen from our air and from our surfaces in the places we live, work, sleep, and shop. Um, back to you, David. All right, great. 
That's great. So let's first talk about applications in place today with 222 and the impact it's had. Uh, we're going to start with a video clip just to hear from some of our recent customers. The holy grail in, in our lives right now is real-time mitigation, real-time mitigation. That is, uh, to me, was the real key to kind of getting people back in the door and making them feel safe. Clearly, the centerpiece of our uh, real-time mitigation are the lights, and we uh, were quite strategic in where we place them. And, uh, you know, the only place I'll have dinner <laughs> is in my own restaurant underneath those lights. The installation was, was super easy. I think for us, it happened uh, overnight in our both our player and our staff locker rooms. So obviously this was one of the products uh, that we installed in order to uh, to both, you know, tangibly help and also give reassurance about um, about the guys when they're in the building that they know we did everything and anything possible uh, in order to ensure, you know, their safety, um, you know, heading into this year. So anything we could do uh, to make the experience safer for the locals, we were looking at, and we felt like healthy was was a uh, you know a, a choice that we needed to make early on in the process, and we believe in in the uh, the science behind. And the healthy lighting, just it, everything about it was sexy, it's pretty, it's um, unobtrusive, it's not scary, and I found that so many people their curiosity about it. First, they read the information that we have about how you step in and turn you know, five seconds, four ways. But I see people who will come in off the street, they'll go through our portal, and then they'll walk out the door. So that makes me happy. All right, great. So our first question, I'm gonna actually go to Bobby and Matt. Each of you were early adopters. Bobby is a customer, Matt as an investor and a customer. So I'm curious to hear, you know, what did you see in 222 that made it most promising to you? I could start Bobby and then hand it off to you. I, uh, I, uh, I first started learning about uh, Bar UV 222 uh, around March of last year, early on in the pandemic. Frankly, I was looking into research about what's a long-term solution. Everything that I was seeing coming out, uh, frankly, felt like it was just a Band-Aid and doing a ton of research, what's a long-term solution in the event that this happens again and how do we help find our way out of it? And it seems obvious that the, the number one issue we need to address is indoor air quality. And uh, I, I started reading about research coming out of Dr. Brenner at Columbia in my hometown. He has been working in his lab tirelessly, trying to sound the alarm that we need to do something because a pandemic is coming and we need to figure out how to go ahead and address indoor air. I started reading all the studies he had done demonstrating that uh, this light, this elegant solution from the sun, uh, a spectrum of light has the ability to deactivate viruses and more importantly, uh, is safe for human contact, safe for your skin, safe for your eyes for the simple reason that uh, the uh, microns of a virus, the outer shell is so small that uh, it, it can't hold up against two to two light. So I think sometimes, you know, academics are doing the hard work. They're out on the front lines and the bleeding edge of figuring out the solutions to our problems. But unless business gets behind it and we help figure out real world practical applications, there's a chance that it could go nowhere for decades. And so frankly, I decided to get involved with my money where my mouth is, like I said, but uh, try to use my platform to bring attention to it because I truly believe that we need to address indoor air quality before another pandemic happens. Uh, Bobby? Yeah, so Magnolia Bakery, um, those of you who know the stores, we're small. Um, all of our locations are small, tight little stores with a lot of employees inside. And New York City was hit hard very early. And I was able to keep two of our stores in New York City open from the beginning of the pandemic. And it really struck me as not only how do I keep my customers safe, but how do I keep my employees safe in an environment where it's constant in and out, new people constantly entering our location. And my husband in his uh, tennis group, they call him Delicato because he has several autoimmune diseases and this constant exposure. He was very worried and he started doing some research as well on UVC lighting, part UVC lighting. And I feel fortunate that we were able to implement this in one of our stores in New York City right away. That gave me that level of comfort, but most importantly, it gave our employees 
that level of comfort that we're doing everything we can to take care of them besides implementing everything that the CDC recommended, social distancing, face mask screens, all of it. But as I said in the little video clip is we still have customers and we're in a neighborhood or a community store. People will come in on their daily walk. They'll walk into the store. They'll walk through the portal. They'll do their turns and walk out the door. So that makes me happy. We are actually doing what this whole thing what it's about. I want people to do that. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I know one of the things that also comes up quite a bit is around safety and efficacy. Uh, given that this is still a new technology, how does this compare to other alternatives? Uh, Dr. Royzen, I'd be curious to hear from you, you know, in your words, how is this particular wavelength safe? Well, as you know, I was under the misimpression that UVA or UVB was what was killing viruses and bacteria. Um, and in fact, all of the tuberculous sanitariums from the 1920s were built in, and the city hospitals were built in the su sunniest part of town to take advantage of that. Well, it turns out it is UVC, and most of the UVC from the sun, that is that wavelength, is filtered out by our atmosphere, by the ozone layer. And so what we needed was how do you provide UVC that's safe? And I started reading on this in saying, is there a way of, for example, having lights in a restaurant or lights in an exam room or lights in a hospital room? Is there a way of using this without harm? And when you read the UVC literature, it shows that um, it damages it has risk for skin cancer and risk for cataracts and other eye injury. So I went to our chair of, um, I'm the wellness officer emeritus at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, so I went to our um, heads and, and scientists in both uh, our eye department and our uh, dermatology department. And they said this wavelength doesn't appear to have the strength to get through to the skin to cause that. And that's some of the data. And in addition, um, the uh, eye scientists believe that um, it had very little risk to the eye um, and the data more confirmed that. So could you use this in an exam room on a gooseneck? Could you use this um, even in uh, airplanes on a gooseneck where, in, where you can read. Could you use this um, in a change room? Could you use this in a hospital room to clean and have it ready quickly and not endanger the current inhabitants? Um, and could you keep the air clean? Could you do this in a lecture room for people? And so the answer was, it looked like 222 that is this wavelength between 205 and 222, but specifically 222 would be excellent at that. And so the question is, how do we get it to be available and to be at a price that can be used and that can make all of us much safer against it? In fact, it, it works against bacteria and Clostridium difficile as well. So there are a lot of advantages in using this. Got it. I, I follow on that to that, Dr. Royzen. Um, you know, I guess one of the questions that also comes up is, you know, thinking about this, the COVID pandemic that we're in, um, you know, hopefully we'll see good results with the vaccine rolling out. What do we think of 222 given that, you know, is it is it still needed? What are your thoughts there? Well, well, as I said, there, there's MRSA, there's all kinds of things that are transmitted from person to person that this works against and protects against and makes the environmental, the environment safer. Um, and for example, if you're worried about the mutants, the South African strain or the Brazilian strain, or even uh, in America, if any of these escape the virus, you really, it, it is, this is a thing against future viruses that have yet to be mutated and will make us all much safer. So this is a uh, technology and, 
and the the neat thing, you know, as, as you know, in an ICU, there are tons of um, buttons that uh, you don't want to contaminate with water or other fluids or alcohol to clean. The same thing that I understand occurs in cockpits from the pictures. And so this is a great way of getting that um, those surfaces clean and without uh, the risk of cross-contamination um, without having to use fluids that might danger the um, equipment. Got it. Hey, Fred, well, can I jump in for one second and ask a follow-up to that? This comes up yeah, a lot, I can ask too, in terms of what's the standard for safety. And a lot of people don't realize the Association of Government Hygienists already has a standard for exposure below which you're still able to effectively uh, eliminate a lot of the viral load in the environment. Can you just get into that a bit? Yeah, I, th I think the, the, there has been uh, for, for years now uh, thresholds and, and uh, limits that have been recognized uh, through occupational safety and others uh, about exposure to 222 and, and other UV as well. And they already reward 222 for a, a higher safety factor. And there's actually at foot a movement to in increase that threshold even higher because the, the, the body of evidence out there that 222 is safe on skin and eyes. And I think that is just going to be a continuing trend. We're going to see that worldwide, not only in the U.S., but other places that 222 has been accepted as being safe. Uh, we, we do accept some exposure levels today under the thresholds, and those exposure levels we accept are more than adequate to, uh, to deactivate a lot of this pathogen. Maybe a follow-up. Follow um, um, you look at other industries, right? There was a Fortune article, Matt, actually, that you shared yesterday referencing a COVID-safe skyscraper, um, and it posed a question in that, right? How do you convince millions of Americans working from home to get back on that subway and return to the office. Um, you know, what's your take on that, Matt? Yeah, I think that uh, we went through a period of the sort of the panic period, a bit of chaos where it was hard to separate the noise from what was real, all these competing different technologies that sort of promised a degree of, you know, salvation. And I frank think, frankly, people started to tune it off. And now that the vaccine has been so extraordinarily f effective that science really has come to the rescue. I mean, it's extraordinary what's happened in the last year, what science has been able to do to ultimately get us out of the pandemic. I think there's being going to be a kind of a silencing a bit of the noise. And we could focus on these long term strategies that address clean uh, indoor air. I think everyone accepts we can never go through this again to the extent to which we can stop it and we can't medicate our way out of it and we can't vaccinate our way out of it. It's way too expensive, complicated, too many lives at risk. So you have to address indoor air quality. And what you're seeing, what's great about that Fortune article, there's more of a consensus building. Okay, we need a new indoor air standard around buildings and there's competing technologies. That's why I think what we're doing today is to bring awareness to far UVC to 222 that we have figured out a way to commercialize it at scale that is affordable, that does. But I think as that article said, we're shifting from a crisis state to, uh, okay, what does a post-pandemic world look like? And it definitely involves a new indoor air standard. Got it. Oh, that's great. Well, so speaking of transportation, like a subway, for example, uh, let's talk about the newest solution when it comes to 222, uh, a B2B solution designed first and foremost around the cockpit of an airplane, the WAN Pro. Uh, as part of this, let's show a quick introduction of it in use. If we can. Hi, I'm Rob, and I'm excited to introduce you to our latest UVC 222 innovation, the Healthy WAN Pro. WAN Pro uses powerful UVC 222 to sanitize surfaces in high traffic areas in seconds. It comes in this practical suitcase, which was designed to be easy to use in offices, schools, public buildings, as well as planes, buses, and other modes of transportation. The WAN Pro is the most powerful and mobile UV surface sanitizer that requires virtually no setup and is designed to clean hard to reach places in seconds. At Healthy, our solutions help create healthier and safer indoor environments and the WAN Pro provides another powerful tool to kill bacteria and viruses. All right, so we know uh, that Boeing has teamed up recently with Healthy on the new WAN Pro, but 
this has actually been in the works of going for a number of years. Teresa, what was your role in that early development? I think most of you um, might have heard about our Fresh Lab. Um, we call it our Clean Cabin Fresh Lab. That was about four years ago, 2016, when we actually rolled out a prototype um, using 222 in a laboratory setting. And we actually test flight that particular laboratory in 2019 in our flight test airplane called the Eco Demonstrator. So we've always believed that 222 was the, um, the eventual end goal, getting a, a system that not only disinfects surfaces, but the air as well in, um, in an area where eventually people are going to be at. When we rolled out the, um, the laboratory implementation of uh, the 222 UV, um, it was designed so that it actually never came on when people were in uh, the laboratory, because at that time, we knew that we couldn't overcome um, you know, concerns about um, safety without more um, research and without more um, education. And um, I believe it was Fred that mentioned that the ACGIH is currently reviewing, um, raising the limits of exposure. And there's a lot more data now substantiate, substantiating the safety of 222. So um, we see our, our vision becoming more of a reality here in the near, not so distant future. Um, but the UV1 um, that we partnered with um, Healthy on is meant to uh, disinfect um, surfaces, especially our flight vac, because our primary concern um, for the time being is getting our airplanes back into the air safely and um, efficiently. And the 222-1 um, actually does that. It helps with turn times. It definitely is um, quicker and more efficient and more effective and it doesn't affect any of our electronics components exactly what we wanted it to do. And so we're really excited about the um, possibilities of um, what our airplane customers uh, will be able to do with the one. Um, and we're just pretty excited about the future of um, how we can apply 222. That's great. Trey, so I guess another question for you on this would just be, if you think about 222 on planes versus current sanitization methods, you know, what is kind of currently being done today to clean a cockpit of an airplane and how would you say that this is better? Well, um, we have explored multiple methods of um, disinfecting the uh, flight deck, everything from chemical disinfectants to ionization to thermal disinfection. And what we found is um, we wanted to make sure whatever solution we selected um, was not only um, safe for the interior, safe for people to use, but it also doesn't interfere with um, the functions of the electronics, the avionics in the flight deck. Um, this by far was the uh, better solution. So after extensive testing, not only for material compatibility in the flight deck and beyond, and also um, 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 our avionics um, functional testing after exposure to UV, um, we've determined that um, UV in general was a more uh, effective method of disinfecting the flight deck and 222 in particular, because eventually if the limits of exposure actually gets lifted, you can actually use 222 to disinfect the flight deck without PPE in the future. So, um, we definitely want to make um, all kinds of solutions available to our airline customers um, to help them um, get through this um, enhanced disinfection requirement during a pandemic. But in the long term, um, I, I think it makes most sense to invest in a solution that is um, the most effective means of disinfecting the, the flight deck. And we hope it's 222. Awesome. Well, let's pick another example. And, and as I'm doing this, just a reminder to all those in the audience, continue to just pose questions in the chat. Um, we're definitely taking a look at that. We're going to bring those up in the Q&A portion. Um, 
But Teresa, another question for you. So if you take a Boeing 737, how long would it take to sanitize the cockpit of the aircraft like that with the One Pro? All right. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, the um, single aisle cockpit and a twin aisle cockpit, like an 87 or a 777 is approximately the same number of switches and, and um, buttons that you'd have to clean. Uh, obviously the twin aisles slightly larger depending on how many crew you can um, you uh, fly with on a twin aisle. But if you um, think about uh, a cockpit in general, we're, we're looking at surfaces to disinfect and what we, um, what we initially intended was for the wand to actually disinfect the cockpit in 15 minutes. And how we determine that is we actually break the cockpit into like 14 different cleaning zones. And each zone is sized by um, how big an area it is that you need to clean. And um, what you'll notice is the wand as design has a, um, has a sensor a lighting sensor, an indicator sensor that blinks after every minute. And it also helps you position the wand so you're exactly the right distance away from the surface. So every second that it blinks, you are to move about a second. Um, and so for every second through a certain zone, for example, we expect you to move about uh, three inches per um, zone. So for 14 zones, um, that allows you to pass through every single area of the flight deck in about eight minutes. So one pass, one person, eight minutes. And because we want to build in a conservative assumption and a safety factor, we require that each zone actually gets multiple passes. And even with that, you can cover an entire flight deck in 15 minutes. And that's with, you know, all the safety factors um, and the conservative uh, uh, assumptions um, rolled in. So we feel pretty confident, confidently that this beats a lot of the other disinfectant methods that um, are currently uh, employed right now to disinfect the flight deck. And this actually is probably going to be a very, very um, enticing um, solution or option for our airlines to use to help hopefully quickly turn around their airplanes. That's great. 15 minutes is really fast. Well, I guess I would be curious to um, also hear Fred if anything to add to that. And while we're asking Fred that question, um, if we can pull up actually Kate's camera, we can show the audience the, uh, the One Pro here. We can actually pull it up. Um, but yeah, Fred, anything to add there? Uh, I, I would just say that uh, the the concept that went into this and, and the sort of built-in re redundancy of, of the of the power of the One Pro uh, is something that people have not let yet expected from two to two. I've been watching the questions as they come up as well. Um, this is two hundred twenty-two nanometers, and and it, it's a fluence that's not been seen before in, in 222 nanometers. This is a much, much higher power device than things you, you've seen on the marketplace. Um, the, the output of this is, is exceptional. And um, I, I will point out to, to, to Teresa, what she said, um, that if, if you utilize this, there is a safety factor that's built into this fluence that is between five and eight times the required fluence to inactivate uh, the specific pathogens we're looking at today based on the protocol that, that Boeing has put together for its utilization. So really exceptionally uh, high power, uh, but very, very light and very easy to use within uh, very confined spaces. So Fred, can you drill down on that a little bit just to uh, contextualize comparing this use case, which is one second, eight minutes to clean the entire car, versus uh, the case of if you had it in an indoor space like an office, right? Based upon Dr. Brenner studies out of Columbia, much lower fluence, and ability to inactivate in around 25 minutes. Can you sort of explain the difference a bit for everybody yeah, watching? So, so, so basically, when you look at the uh, the lamps that have been utilized so far in 222 in sort of the public spaces, uh, they, they tend to be between 10 and 20 watt type emitters, uh, and, and they tend to be at significant distances, which therefore reduces the fluence on, on a surface, which is what some testing was, uh, or, or specifically an air at, at a distance. Uh, the fluence out of the, this, this wand is between 
between uh, the source itself is, is six to 700 watts. Um, so you're dealing with orders of magnitude uh, of additional output. Um, and th therefore, the, the time it takes to clean either a surface or the air between the surface and, and that is, is very, very swift. Uh, we're, we're seeing you know, so between log three and log six type kill levels simply in, in a pass of, of the wand over a surface. So I guess asking kind of the group here, where, where do we think the WAN Pro could be used beyond transportation, other use cases, you know, where could we see this potential impact? Maybe I'll start with uh, Dr. Royzen, any thoughts from your side? Um, well, the, the areas uh, that I think are obvious, if you will, is if you have a gooseneck version of this, or even just to clean uh, hospital rooms and exam rooms quickly, um, without doing, or especially ICU areas where there's a lot of uh, electronics, those make uh, sense pretty um, quickly. Um, the other areas uh, that I think of are when you travel, you wonder about uh, the hotel rooms, you wonder about um, cars, et cetera, and all of that can be done uh, quickly. Um, but the, and the, the other area that I'm excited about is because of other viruses, not just this, and other bacteria, not just this, are um, you could use, the, uh, if you will, versions of this, that is the, the light type setting, and even the magnolia bakery type setting as in uh, restaurants um, and other shops that you go into um, to demonstrate this. And you actually have not shown the elevator version of this um, since uh, I suspect that, that will also demonstrate to customers, apartment owners, um, apartment uh, renters, etc., that you're doing everything in your power to keep those areas uh, safe. So maybe you're going to show that and I'm disturbing that the flow that you wanted, but at least those are set. You've developed a number of other um, instruments or, or applications of 222 that make it um, more available. So um, I hope I'm not uh, in killing the order. No, that's great, Mike, Dr. Royzen. All right, well, I guess maybe just posing another question to the group. Let's step back and think about 222 more generally. Um, Bobby, Matt, you know, you're both from New York. Where would you like to see 222 being applied next in your city? That's a great question. I mean, I, I, I really feel like it could be in restaurants. Uh, it could be in office spaces. It should be in anywhere where we spend a ton of time, you know, congregating, where we want to reinstill our faith that it's a safe environment. And I, I think going back to the, the, the thesis, right, there's early studies. There's a lot of studies around the world showing that the amount of viral load in an environment is going to affect how sick people get, how many people get sick. So if you have this light on continuously and just throwing the number out there from the Brenner study, it could, you know, deactivate viruses in a space in 25 minutes, right? You have this constant, constant sort of shield of protection. It's going to limit, uh, you know, not just the transmission of whether it's, you know, COVID, it's also going to uh, deal with uh, influenza rates, which is uh, it's sort of a use case that we've kind of ignored of late for obvious reasons. So I'd like to see it rolled out in any uh, indoor environment where we spend a ton of time uh, and uh, and then just keep putting out more and more studies that demonstrate that uh, not only is it safe, which we have a ton of science, but also effective, right? There's a study that was uh, just published or uh, underway in Nova Scotia that's looking at it in a senior citizen facility to see not only how it uh, deals with you know coronavirus, but also influenza. So Anywhere you can imagine where we spend a ton of time indoors, I think ultimately you're going to find two, two, two. It's not going to happen overnight, which is why this awareness is a long-term uh, passion for all of us, uh, you know, on this live stream because it's not it's not instantaneous to roll out two, two, two light around planet Earth. But it begins by you know telling the story and making people aware. Yeah, you know, in the restaurant industry, it's um, like restaurants and retail. We tend to work in multiple shifts. So unlike an office environment, you come in at nine, you leave at five. In the restaurant and retail world, it's morning, afternoon, and evening. So having the ability to clean and sanitize and disinfect between shifts would give another level of confidence to our staff and employees knowing that, that my next shift that's coming in to match, who's going to answer a telephone or work on a desktop, that someone's gone through that step and completely taken care of their environment. 
All right. Well, maybe another question for this group would just be, if you think about um, another area like schools, um, you know, how could 222 play a role there? So Fred, maybe just getting your thoughts there. So I, th I, th I think in general, 22 will play a role, role across many, many uh, industries, locations, buildings, and, and the whole built environment. Uh, but schools is one of those areas where you really want to be able to reduce the pathogen load as quickly as you can. And you need to do it in real time because kids are moving around from classroom to classroom, from hallway to bathroom, to gym, to locker room. Uh, and in that transition, they are essentially reinfecting the space over and over and over again. Uh, the only real technology we have today in the toolkit to deploy um, is dealing with something like 222 in the space to in real time clean it. And there's been movements around uh, you know, improving HVAC systems, which is perfectly fine. But what people will find is uh, there's very, very limits of effectiveness based on what is actually in the environment. So I'm in an area today that has cubicles on the walls, or they have plexiglass in spaces. Well, HVAC won't penetrate that, right? As soon as you create barriers, and there's been studies around this as well that have been published recently, um, we're looking at areas where you may not get air. You may have stagnant air in the space, or you may have areas because of the way the ventilation system was set up 30, 40 years ago it was built. It doesn't adequately pass air through it, and it may be actually be passing a pathogen through instead of cleaning the air. So 222 allows us within the space of a school, a classroom, or otherwise, to simply go in and clean the space in real time and reduce that pathogen load, which is, I think, of critical importance as we go forward. All right, that's great. Well. Um, why don't we actually go ahead and move into the q and I think we started to with even that question. Um, is, there a, uh, is there a first question that we want to pull up? If not, we can kind of continue. Hey, David. I'm wondering if maybe we can get Fred and Dr. Roizen to help respond to a comment that I, I see on, on our um, feed that actually we get a lot of. Um, with regards to how fast we can disinfect um, based on the log three required kill um, for SARS-CoV-2, which we know is around three millijoules per centimeter squared. But as you know, um, um, that research, I believe from uh, Columbia University also mentioned that it takes a lot of time to get to a log three kill, 25 minutes. Um, so I'm wondering if we can spend some time explaining um, <laughs> efficacy and how we get to it based on power, distance, and time a little bit. So uh, if, if, I, if I can start, unless Mike, if you want to, I, I'm happy to jump in real quick. No, no, yours, you, you take this, Fred. This okay. is your feed. So, um, and, and Teresa, thank you. Um, when we look at millijoules or, or milliwatts, if, if man, we're applying it, um, the, the studies have shown uh, for COVID specifically um, that it takes between 1.3 and 3 uh, millijoules uh, per centimeter squared to inactivate uh, COVID essentially. Um, a product like the One Pro, uh, and I say like because it is the only one out there today, um, is actually developing um, something in excess of three times that uh, per second. So um, when we're looking at, at, at inactivation rates, um, in theory, um, and we apply it to practice as well, uh, the inactivation of the WAN Pro would be about a third of a second to reach the, the inactivation rate of, of COVID. So the, that's why I said there's a, there's a lot of headroom built into the, the operation of that. Um, when we look at other spaces where we're putting uh, this, and, and to be clear, the inactivation rate of that is dependent on the distance and the distance is set by indicators that are built within the system that show you exactly the distance to be held. And that distance is about four inches. Um, within lighting, we have uh, very, very specific rules of physics and laws of physics. And that says that as we double that distance, we only have about one fourth the power. So you can imagine when we put something into the ceiling and we reduce the wattage and we are compliant with all the regulations, we have a much lower, lower fluence rate. Uh, and what Dr. Brenner found was that fluence rate uh, at, at using a 10 or 20 watt source versus a six or 700 watt source um, was such that it takes some minutes of time to, to inactivate uh, the pathogen. Um, but all within very, very reasonable bounds if you're within a building, um, there, there will be higher power devices as time come and as thresholds uh, rise, but it's, uh, it, it's incredibly fast with the, with the WAN Pro. Um, and with other devices that are out there, it's slower based on the distance and the amount of fluence coming out of that device. 
f f Fred, define fluence a little better for us, would you? Because I think that's part of the question, meaning this produces, at least as I understand it, a lot more energy. It's the same UV222, but it comes with enough energy to do the kill in much shorter time. And I think what people need to know is what fluence is. So, so fluence that uh, we'll refer to in, in millijoules uh, or, or in milliwatts, uh, depending on what we're talking about with the device or how long it's been on its surface, it, it is the amount of that energy that falls within the bandwidth that we are concerned with that's capable of, of inactivating uh, the specific pathogen. So it, it's literally a measure of the amount of energy you can have that light source that will be potentially potential to inactivate the pathogen. All right. I, I know there was another question that was put on the screen before for Bobby, I think, right, uh, with concerns about safety around your staff and your customers and how, to, you know, what's the benefit to a chemical free of a chemical free solution? I think that's what it was. Yeah. So at Magnolia Bakery, because of the size of our stores, which are small and the um, just the mechanics of our space, we were only able to install one component, which was the portal, which you can see over Fred's right shoulder. I think. So it's a choice. I can tell that. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. I love it. It's sexy. It's sleek. It's simple. But we do, we offer it as a choice. So it's not a requirement for any to, anyone to pass through it, whether it's our employees or our customers. But what I find is that most people want to go through the portal. We provide the information. Um, they can read about it. They can make, the, make their own decision of how they want to move forward. But I wouldn't have installed the unit if I didn't feel 100% confident that it was safe. So we did that work first, a lot of discussions with Fred, making sure that um, that it was in the environment that our customers would also feel that it was an, an added level of safety and security. All right. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one here. It says, what does the CDC say about 222? Uh, Fred, do you want to take that one? I, I can. Um, so, so right now, the, the body within the United States uh, that has provenance over this type of te technology is the EPA. And there is, an, again, an EPA criteria, a registration process that 222 falls under. And all these products that we manufacture today have to go through that registration pro uh, process and have all those documents in place. But the EPA currently is the, uh, the body that, that uh, regulates the use of 222 in these spaces. All right. This can, I, uh, can, I, uh, can I uh, throw oh, this one up there? Fred, Fred, staying with you for a second. So can you talk a little bit about that whole log reduction and sort of the theory of if you have this light running continuously in a place, in a space, and it takes 25 minutes to sort of, you know, cleanse the air. Just give us your general take on what's the what's the what's the implication for people coming in and out of that space? Well, I, I think the implication you sort of got to before, Matt, is that as we reduce the viral load, uh, there is good indication that that reduces the potential communicability of whatever the pathogen might be. Um, so it, it may be that it, it's eight minutes to get to one, 18 minutes to get to another, 30 minutes to get to one. But the idea is we're continually cleaning that space. Uh, and unlike all these other technologies we try to apply, whether we want to spray the air, whether we want to um, ionize, whether we want to clean surfaces, this is working continuously. So the space is, is continuously getting cleaner and cleaner unless more pathogens introduced, in which case it's cleaning it yet again. So the, the idea is that this creates sort of this, this virtuous cycle of, of something that you enter, you clean it, and you continue to clean it because it could be on all the time because it is uh, a human safe technology. Uh, we don't need to put new personnel on there to clean space again. It's just working all the time. Um, so uh, as the question asked, log three is 99.9. .9, and yes, and that's sort of a first threshold, but it just continues to clean afterwards. Uh, I would say with uh, the WAN Pro that we talked about before, we're achieving far beyond that even, even in, in a first pass. So it's a very, very rapid uh, cleaning of that space. Right. All right. All right. This one's for Teresa, I think. Um, so as you think about the one solution, what, what do you think is going to be most impactful in terms of outcome? Well, um, I think for us, it's getting our um, airplanes back into the air and getting people flying confidently again. Um, that's always been our priority when we um, kind of pivoted um, from a, a in airplane application to help come up with a solution 
for um, the near term to get our get our customers some help um, taking care of um, our airplanes and making sure our aircraft is safe. So that's been kind of our driving focus. But we also know that when we introduce uh, technology, we have to do it slowly um, to, um, because we want people to feel comfortable um, with it. And we know that it, it will take time. It seems like it's a new thing, um, but it really isn't. Um, the technology has existed for quite some time, uh, like you mentioned. and. Um, the possibility of integrating it into the airplane is new. That's that's a new aspect. Um, so introducing it slowly this way, taking care of disinfecting our airplanes first, that's to us the first step. Um, and eventually getting people um, familiar and comfortable enough with it so that we can actually have um, 222 in the cabin and perhaps also someday when we can actually have 222 on while people are present is our next step. All right, great. I saw some questions in there about PPE. Um, do you wanna to speak to that? Just sort of, if it's safe, why is PPE required? Fred, do you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, there, there are actually you know, several pieces to the answer, but uh... Yeah, piece number one is we're, we're sending people into an area that, that may well be contaminated and there's a concern for their, for their health and safety. Uh, second, as we said before, there is a threshold around NIOSH and occupational safety and OSHA that says we can only expose people to a certain amount of 222. And though the wand is only uh, projecting out uh, light onto surfaces, there is an amount of reflected light that can't be completely characterized today. So based on that characterization uh, that will become, they will likely exceed the thresholds that currently are accepted on, under NIOSH and occupational safety and some of the other uh, thresholds we have there today. We believe those are going to increase and that ultimately might change what we do inside the cockpit, but given today's regulation, uh, we think that is the, the safe way to use it. All right, and then I, I think there was also some posts about chemicals and I know we've spoken to this, but I guess maybe Fred, staying on you for a second, you know, how is this better than chemicals? Um, can you talk about just more generally 222, whether the One Pro or others? Yeah. Well, what, what, we've, what we've seen and one of the reasons I think why Boeing got into this to, to begin with was there, there are appropriate places where chemicals can be used, but there, there are issues with exposure uh, to people. Um, but there's also issues with uh, exposure to equipment. Some equipment simply cannot sustain uh, being treated with, with, with chemicals. Uh, it, it creates havoc with some uh, fine electronics. Uh, some displays have issues with chemicals as well, where the 222 can be used very safely uh, on that. And we've done that type of material testing, as, as Boeing has initially, uh, that indicates that this is a, uh, a, a better way uh, to treat those types of surfaces. All right, and I think Matt, you brought this one up. Um, maybe Fred, staying with you for a second. Ready for commercial rollout rather than small trials. Do you want to speak to that? Uh, happy to. We're ready. <laughs> we're, we're ready. We're producing it. Um, we have two, two, two uh, throughout uh, mobile installations throughout the country and, and some in the world. So uh, I, I think the, the answer very, very quickly there is we've been in uh, commercial um, production for, I guess it's, it's almost nearing a year now. All right, we'll take one more question that I know we're gonna have Fred uh, spend just another couple minutes at the end. So, um, okay, so this one, has a connection been made with the government to implement 222 throughout the country? And, and Fred, I pulled this one up because I think that's kind of where we could use everyone's help who's watching right now. We are, we are exiting a period where there was a lot of mistrust and confusion and apprehension around science and government. And I think we're, we're in a period of, of healing, but we're also in a period where science has triumphantly gotten us out of this crisis through the vaccine. And there is an opportunity to now engage in a conversation around what else can science do? So, and Fred, you know, jump in here, but I think that's where we could use everybody's help, uh, help who's watching right now. Bring this, to bring these studies to everyone's attention. We'll make all the information available. Happy to debate anybody. Uh, Fred's devoted his life to it. People like Teresa have worked really hard to commercialize it. Dr. Rosen at the Cleveland Clinic has been out front advocating it. Magnolia Bakery is an early user because somebody has to go first. Where we need the help of everybody watching right now is to engage your local 
elected officials at any level, New York City Council, your congressman uh, and woman, your you know federal government officials, now would be the time to have a long-term conversation about about planning. But Fred, I know you've you've done incredible work with the White House in the past. You've done work with NASA. Can you just give a sense of the lay of the land where we are now in those conversations? Yeah, so I, I think you, you captured most of it there, Matt, but the, the, the short version is let's speak about it, let's debate it, let's talk about it, let's look at the science, and let's go where the science tells us to go. Um, the, 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 these studies are compelling. Uh, they, they, this makes a wonderful tool and, and weapon against this pathogen and, and future pathogens. Um, and I think all the engagement, uh, I spend a lot of time uh, speaking to folks in, in, in politics, in school systems, uh, in, in legislatures. And I, I really do believe that um, with education, with, with open and honest and transparent uh, testing, uh, this is a wonderful tool and will emerge so. Um, so I think we'll see more and more of it, but it's it's about going out and educating and talking and having these very, very healthy debates around it that will we'll move it forward. Well, Fred, Stan with you. So now that we've had the One Pro developed and it's launching, what can we look forward to next from Healthy? Uh, so the, the, I'll say first uh, many things, but uh, I'll, I'll bring one to, to bear today. Uh, and just so happens I have one next to me. Um, this is actually um, a, a, a light that is designed. Um, it, it, it is 222. I've got an extension cord on it right now, so you have to excuse that. But this will mount to wall ceilings of, um, of either cabins or elevators or rooms or buildings or courthouses or um, anything. Or subway, ideas, or subway, or subway, subway. Or, or subway cars or subways. Um, but the idea is that this is a, a form factor that is actually going to allow us to bring 222 in a higher power form than has been seen before uh, into the, the, all these other environments. Uh, it can be used to treat air, it can be used to treat surfaces, and it's just it's sort of limitless to where it can go. Um, it's probably just a couple more months away uh, in terms of its commercialization, but uh, moving very, very quickly. All right, all right, awesome. Well, thank you everybody for joining our event today. Um, thank you again to each of our speakers, including Matt for hosting us on one of his channels. Um, I know we didn't get to each of the questions, uh, but we did see those come through and we will actually be following up individually uh, where possible with those people on those questions that we didn't get to. Um, you know, let's continue to drive this technology as engineers, innovators and pioneers across each of our respective areas to improve our indoor spaces. Um, as Matt said, you know, it, it's, it's taking all of us really to continue to drive awareness to this new technology. We're actually gonna play one last video here um, as we come to a close and as we think about the future of FAR UVC 222. In the vast darkness of space, the future of human health shines bright. 20 years ago, we captured the power of the stars and pioneered lighting that helped astronauts thrive. It kept them alert and let them sleep even far from home. So we beamed it back to Earth, where we used it to illuminate villages, rescue wildlife, and grow food at the South Pole. Now, we're helping the whole planet get healthy. Our solutions use UVC-222, which can kill viruses and bacteria, to sanitize what we touch and what we breathe. They also change light spectrum to regulate the body's internal clock, boost performance, and enhance sleep. Sound like a lot of science? It is. But that's what it takes to keep our planet safe, connected, and healthy. Get enlightened at healthyinc.com.